2017, one of the most infamous years regarding tropical activity in the Atlantic Basin. With 17 named storms and 6 major hurricanes, it goes without saying that 2017 was the most active season at the time since 2010. While the season started off weak, it was August into September that would tell the story of the hurricane season that year. The year was remembered for a trio of storms specifically, all of them happening in the span of a month of each other. Harvey, wreaking havoc onto the state of Texas with extreme rainfall totals. Irma, obliterating the islands of the Caribbean and slamming into southern Florida. And the subject of today's video, Maria, the deadliest hurricane in the Atlantic Basin since Hurricane Mitch, destroying the islands of Dominica and Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria was the last of the three well-remembered storms of the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, forming in mid-September. However, Hurricane Maria was a storm that could hardly be forgotten. The hurricane brought its wrath to a large portion of the Lesser Antilles, but the primary focus was on the U.S. Virgin Islands, Dominica, and most importantly, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, the small Caribbean island, was destroyed, with infrastructure and an economy that was already in shambles, having no match against the wrath of the second strongest hurricane of that season, and the most intense tropical cyclone in terms of pressure that occurred that year. The response to Maria was an utter disaster. The worst response to a natural disaster by the government since Hurricane Katrina. In total, over 3,000 people died in Maria, with the vast majority of them being in Puerto Rico. It's been over five years since then, and there's still a lot of talk about the storm today. So today, I will be taking a deep dive into Hurricane Maria, going over the state of the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season so far, the origins of the system, the preparations taken, the impacts to the Caribbean islands, the aftermath, the government response, and the significance of the event. Welcome to Nature's Fury. The 2017 Atlantic hurricane season is one of the most infamous hurricane seasons of the Atlantic Basin, primarily because it's the costliest season on record. While the hurricane season itself started off slow like most hurricane seasons, the season blew up in activity at the end of August. The first major storm was Hurricane Harvey, which began as an uneventful tropical storm in the Caribbean before reforming in the Gulf of Mexico, making landfall in the state of Texas as a Category 4 hurricane before stalling over the state. The second major storm was Hurricane Irma, a Category 5 monster that tore through the Caribbean islands before making landfall in southwest Florida as a Category 4 hurricane. But as Hurricane Irma was dying over land in the southeastern United States, the primary focus of the National Hurricane Center was the developing tropical wave off of the coast of Africa. That tropical wave would develop into the most intense tropical cyclone that was observed that year. But real quick, the majority of people who like these videos are not subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy what I create, consider subscribing. It helps the channel and tells me I'm doing something right. Anyways, back to Hurricane Maria. The precursor to Maria developed as a tropical wave off of the coast of Africa on September 12th, traveling over the warm waters of the open Atlantic over the next few days, producing scattered and disorganized deep convection. What was not expected was for the storm to organize itself as fast as it did. A post-analysis report by the National Hurricane Center mentions that when the tropical wave originally formed, four to five days out, both the GFS and European models did not show signs of a closed center of circulation. But by September 16th, in contrast to what the models were predicting at the time, the tropical wave became more organized, and at 11 a.m. Atlantic Standard Time, the system was designated as a potential tropical cyclone, then designated as a tropical depression at 2 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. The system would move westward, as a mid-level high-pressure system which dominated the majority of the North Atlantic was present to the north. Just six hours later after being designated as a potential tropical cyclone, the system reached tropical storm intensity, and was given the name Maria. Maria was forecast to approach the Lesser Antilles, strengthening into a hurricane as it approached the islands, the name straight for Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. Its strength forecasting, however, ended up underestimating how extreme Maria's rapid intensification episode would end up being on its way to its landfall in Dominica. Tropical storm watches were designated for portions of the Lesser Antilles, with more watches and warnings being issued throughout the storm's lifespan. The preparations taken in advance of Maria were complicated. It's not like the islands of the Caribbean didn't take action ahead of the storm. The U.S. Virgin Islands, Dominica, Guadalupe, Martinique, Puerto Rico, and other islands in the region stocked up on supplies, boarded up windows, opened emergency shelters, and asked for citizens to evacuate. 
The same preparations also applied to areas later down the line, such as in the Dominican Republic and the Turks and Caicos Islands. However, the entire region was already fatigued, and for the Northern Islands, they were still reeling at assessing the damage from what happened less than two weeks prior. In early September, Hurricane Irma, one of the strongest hurricanes recorded in the Atlantic Basin, tore through the northern islands of the Lesser Antilles, specifically the Leeward Islands and the U.S. Virgin Islands, where the absolute worst of the damage was observed. Those same areas that were hit by Hurricane Irma were now expected to face the wrath of Maria. Locals stated that they were emotionally exhausted, but there wasn't much preparation to do as everything they had set up for Hurricane Irma was still there for Maria. But while locals there braced for it, the location and the path of Maria that got the most attention was the island of Puerto Rico. Compared to the other islands in the path of Maria, Puerto Rico was one of the most vulnerable locations when it came to impacts to the island and its residents. But why? A lot of what went wrong with the recovery and impacts in Puerto Rico come from issues that have nothing to do with Hurricane Maria itself. The issues that surround Puerto Rico prior to Maria's landfall need to be discussed in detail, as those issues explain how such a disaster occurred to a U.S. territory, why it happened, how and why the recovery effort went horribly, and why the storm ended up being the worst disaster to rock the island in Puerto Rico's history. The finer details are complicated and messy, but I'll try my best to explain this the best I can. The first issue lies in the state of Puerto Rico in relation to the United States. Puerto Rico is a United States-designated territory, not a state. In 1901, the Supreme Court designated that Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam were U.S. territories, and adding that because they were not states, the Constitution did not apply in full. What the court verdict meant is that basic constitutional rights for American citizens in the states aren't guaranteed for those in the U.S. territories. As to what rights those territories get, it's up to Congress. Why is this a problem? Well, it means that governmental programs that are in place in the states, such as Medicare and Medicaid, and access to governmental resources that can help vulnerable communities are more limited in U.S. territories than in the states. There are technically representatives that are from U.S. territories in the House, however, they cannot vote on the House floor. I know someone is probably pointing out that the U.S. Virgin Islands are also a U.S. territory, and did not receive the same media attention as the aftermath in Puerto Rico. The U.S. Virgin Islands were hammered hard by Hurricane Irma, and we're still recovering from that. But the biggest differences between the two is population and their debt. The recovery effort in the U.S. Virgin Islands was also horrible. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Virgin Islands were hit both by Maria and Irma head-on, and because the U.S. Virgin Islands are more remote and less populous than Puerto Rico. Irma was also important regarding preparations for the U.S. territories. Despite being U.S. territories, that doesn't mean that they are ineligible for aid from FEMA. However, the resources that FEMA has for the U.S. territories in the Caribbean are far more limited than what the rest of the country has. At the time, FEMA only had one warehouse for the Caribbean territories. That was in Puerto Rico. Most of the supplies that were in that warehouse were already distributed across the Virgin Islands and portions of Puerto Rico because of Hurricane Irma. Maria arrived before supplies could be replenished. While Puerto Rico was not directly struck by Irma, the island still suffered significantly from the storm, with more than 70% of the households in the territory being left without power. 96% of households and businesses did have their power restored before Maria, but it leads to a much bigger issue in Puerto Rico that was present for over a decade before Maria happened. Puerto Rico is one of the poorest territories in the United States, with double the poverty rate of the state of Mississippi. 58% of the children in Puerto Rico live in poverty, and the unemployment rate in the territory was 10.1% in 2017. A lot of the poverty and unemployment on the island stems from the fact that the government of Puerto Rico was multiple billions of dollars in debt at the time. How much? Well, at its peak, they owed $70 billion to creditors. How did Puerto Rico come into this much debt? I'm stopping myself on that train of thought right here. It's a massive, complex issue that I really don't have the time to explain. TLDR watched the Last Week Tonight episode on Puerto Rico. At the time I'm recording this, Puerto Rico has exited bankruptcy and 80% of its debt has been cleared. But at the time Maria happened, the effects of the debt went onto the locals who had to pay more for basic goods and services through more taxes and just higher prices overall. The debt was also an issue for basic infrastructure. Before Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico, 
the power grid was in dire need of upgrades. The Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority was struggling due to $9 billion in debt, and a budget cut due to the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, or PROMISA, and 30% of the workforce being lost since 2012. The median age for the power plants in Puerto Rico was 44 years, and with inadequate safety mechanisms plaguing the grid, it was just a matter of time before a major storm took it out completely. The island's water system was also in substandard condition. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, 70% of the island had water that did not meet the standards of the 1974 Safe Drinking Water Act. Overall, Puerto Rico, due to a series of events that started all the way back when it was claimed by the United States after the Spanish-American War, was extremely vulnerable to a storm like Maria. In Puerto Rico, evacuation orders were issued, and 450 shelters were opened on the island. By September 19th, at least 2,000 people seek shelter. Researchers found that a rather substantial exodus occurred in the days leading up to Maria, with around 20% of the population leaving for the U.S. mainland. At this point, there was nothing else that the islands could do than to board up and hope for the best. Little did they know that Maria's rampage through the tropical islands would be the worst that they would observe in recent memory. Just a day after being named, Maria intensified to a hurricane on September 17th, and was already undergoing rapid intensification. All the way until its landfall in Dominica, models in the NHC did not anticipate for Maria to rapidly intensify as soon as it did. But the NHC continued to update the forecast, which looked more and more dire for the areas in Maria's path. Maria, in the span of 24 hours, went from an 85 mile per hour Category 1 hurricane into a 165 mile per hour Category 5 aiming straight for the Lesser Antilles. Areas anywhere near Maria saw its wrath as it exploded in intensity. The outer rain bands of Maria produced heavy rainfall and strong wind gusts across the southern Windward Islands, receiving multiple inches of rain which led to scattered rock slides and landslides. Several areas saw blackouts or damaged power lines. The northern Leeward Islands luckily escaped the worst of Maria's wrath after being shredded into piles of debris by Hurricane Irma but the island still suffered from tropical storm force winds and heavy rain from the storm's outer bands. In Barbados, multiple inches of rainfall and high winds caused major flooding and blackouts on the island. Martinique was spared by Maria's hurricane force wind field, as it passed about 30 miles to the north of the island. But torrential rainfall and strong wind gusts led to 40% of the population being without power. North of Dominica, Guadalupe suffered hurricane force wind gusts and heavy rain, causing heavy devastation across the southern portions of the island. 80,000 homes were without electricity, and almost the entire banana crop was destroyed. And yet, it was worse for the nation of Dominica. Only two years had passed since Tropical Storm Erica, which was considered to be one of the worst natural disasters to hit the country in recorded history. And then, there was Maria, aiming straight for Dominica. The island was battered by Maria's raw power, as Maria made landfall on the small island of Dominica as a Category 5 hurricane at 9.15pm Atlantic Standard Time on September 18th. Maria thus became the first and only Category 5 hurricane to make landfall on the island. Nearly every home on the island suffered roof damage. House after house began being submerged under floodwaters, all communication services cutting the small tropical island off from the rest of the world. The island was flattened into just a field of debris but the true devastation would not be observed until daylight came the next day. After Maria's landfall in Dominica, the storm briefly weakened as it entered the northeastern Caribbean Sea due to land interaction with Dominica, but that weakening was short-lived. As it headed straight for Puerto Rico, the storm reached its peak strength as a 175 mile per hour Category 5 hurricane, with a minimum central pressure of 908 millibars. Maria's pressure was the lowest pressure from a tropical cyclone observed in 2017, and it was aiming straight for Puerto Rico. However, as it approached land, Maria underwent an eyeball replacement cycle, weakening to a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 155 miles per hour and a pressure of 920 millibars, as it made landfall in Yabucoa, Puerto Rico. However, that weakening did not do much to alleviate the utter hell that was occurring down on the ground in Puerto Rico and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. While the northern U.S. Virgin Islands were relatively spared, not all of the islands were as lucky, 
specifically St. Croix. St. Croix experienced the northern portion of the Outer Iowa, with wind damage being evident across the island, with widespread flooding occurring on the island. On the other islands, such as St. Thomas and St. John, most of the islands were already destroyed by Hurricane Irma, but large rainfall totals ranging from 5 to 10 inches led to flooding across the islands. However, the worst of Maria was being observed to the west in Puerto Rico. In the overnight hours of September 19th and throughout the 20th, Maria unleashed her wrath onto the small island of Puerto Rico, showing no mercy whatsoever. The majority of structures suffered extreme wind damage, and the high winds ended up destroying the NWS San Juan radar. Wind gusts over 100 miles per hour were reported across the island, as the island would experience major hurricane force winds throughout the 20th. Its Iowa replacement cycle only prolonged the amount of time the island saw high winds, but the roaring winds across the island were the least of the island's worries. It was the flooding and storm surge that truly had Puerto Rico reeling from Maria. The island saw at least six inches of rain as a whole, but the vast majority of the island saw rainfall totals ranging from 12 inches to 30 inches of rainfall, with a maximum rainfall total of 37 inches being observed in Caguas. The heavy rains led to the La Plata River flooding, leading to multiple communities being submerged underwater. The weak infrastructure stood no match to the treacherous waters on the island, and the storm surge just made the situation worse. Along the eastern shore, the combined storm surge and tide produced inundation levels of 6 to 9 feet, specifically near Umacao, Naguabo, and Seba. The southeast coast saw inundation levels of 4 to 7 feet, such as in areas near Yabucoa, Manubo, Patillas, and Arroyo. Inundation levels in northeastern Puerto Rico was from 3 to 5 feet between Farado and Ceiba, and along much of the southern coast from Arroyo to Ponce. Maria made landfall on the southeastern coast of Puerto Rico around 6.15 a.m. on September 20th, and would slowly track over the island on the 20th. Maria's wrath would only subside as it left the island and tracked into the northern Atlantic the next day. Hurricane Maria weakened down to a high-end Category 2 hurricane after making its way through Puerto Rico, and would begin to re-intensify into a major hurricane after its weakening period. Of course, never back to the strength it once had earlier in its life. Maria's impacts would be through heavy rain and gusty winds that Maria brought to the Turks and Caicos Islands and the Dominican Republic. Thousands of homes were destroyed or damaged, and many communities were cut off as a result of flooding. Maria would travel along the mid-level high, and up into the northern Atlantic, retaining its status as a major hurricane throughout most of its life, although not strengthening as it encountered vertical wind shear. However, Maria would show signs of post-tropical transition as it moved north, losing its eyewall structure by September 25th. Storm surge watches and warnings were put in place in North Carolina as Maria came near the shoreline. However, no major damage was reported in the Carolinas. The storm raced to the north before taking a sharp turn to the east, and becoming post-tropical as it crossed the northern Atlantic. Maria's remnant cyclone would dissipate on October 2nd. Of course, the primary focus was on the islands that were hit directly, and the devastation, specifically in Dominica and Puerto Rico, was the worst damage seen in those areas in recorded history. Every location in the path of Maria saw damage in one way or another, most areas suffering severe damage due to the storm. But I'd like to cover everywhere except Puerto Rico first. The majority of the central Lesser Antilles saw Maria's destruction first. Areas south of Dominica did not see much damage, such as Martinique, suffering from wind damage and heavy downpours. But the majority of the damage laid to the north. Guadalupe saw vast destruction from heavy rainfall, with 80,000 homes being without power and the agriculture sector suffering major losses. But it was Dominica that saw the worst of Maria before it struck Puerto Rico. Images the day after Maria's landfall showed the once luscious tropical island turned into a field of debris scattered about. Houses were devastated, with multiple houses on the coastline and further inland completely destroyed or uninhabitable. Public buildings suffered extensive damage, and all of the residents of Dominica were affected in one way or another by Maria's fury. The capital of Razu, was in complete ruins. Power poles and power lines littered the streets, 
The main road was reduced to flooded asphalt as the city was destroyed by the strong winds and torrential flooding. The worst destruction was in the east coast and in rural areas, where many towns such as St. David Parish, Castle Bruce, and Good Hope were wiped off the map. Numerous banana and tubular plantations were lost, wiping out an important source of income for the country. In total, Maria caused over $1 billion in damages in Dominica and killed 65. The U.S. Virgin Islands, well, the Northern Islands already were in ruin because of Hurricane Irma, so there wasn't a whole lot to destroy that wasn't already destroyed by Irma. But the island of St. Croix suffered major damage from Maria, getting hit by the outer eye wall of the storm. 10 to 20 inches of rainfall fell on the island, with it taking nearly a year for power to be restored to most residents. A federal disaster declaration was signed by President Donald Trump to allow more federal funding for the people who lived in St. Croix. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, three people died, with four people being reported missing. The Dominican Republic and Haiti saw heavy rain from Maria, which caused severe flooding that led to thousands of people losing power and cutting off several communities from getting help. In total, five people died in the Dominican Republic, with one being missing, and three people died in Haiti. The Turks and Caicos Islands saw minimal damages, and so did the mainland United States. Four people died due to rip currents in the mainland United States due to Maria. However, the absolute worst of the damage came from Puerto Rico, which was left virtually unrecognizable. First pictures now coming in from Puerto Rico after taking a direct hit. Hurricane Maria slamming into the island, and as you heard, one official saying the island is destroyed. 150 mile an hour winds ripping buildings apart, knocking out power everywhere. All of the electricity is out tonight. People are ordered to stay inside until at least tomorrow, and then fears of more massive flooding to come. As the sun rose on September 21st, images began to come through of what was left of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And what was left was the aftermath of the worst disaster to rock the U.S. territory, with a population of nearly 3 million people. Hundreds of thousands of buildings in the territory were heavily damaged because of the strong winds, heavy rain, and storm surge. Widespread flooding occurred all across the island. In San Juan, floodwaters were waist-deep, and the coastal neighborhood of La Perla was largely destroyed. Over 300,000 buildings were destroyed according to the governor, and hundreds of thousands more were damaged. Of course, the worst of the flooding occurred along the La Plata River Basin, where multiple flooding records for the river were either tied or broken outright due to the over 20 inches of rainfall that fell across large swaths of the island. The floodgate released at the La Plata Lake Dam, which trapped the town of Toa Baja under the floodwaters. Survivors recounted that floodwaters rose at least 6 feet within 30 minutes, and floodwaters were as deep as 15 feet in the municipality. 80% of the territory's agriculture was lost due to Maria. The power grid, which already was in a state of desperate need of repair, was completely and totally destroyed. It would be many months before many areas would even begin to receive power once more, as the island was still in crippling debt. Communications were downed across the island, with 95% of cell networks being down, 85% of above-ground phone and internet lines being knocked out, and only 12 radio stations remained on the air during Maria. Landslides were constant as the rain battered the island, with some locations seeing more than 25 landslides per square mile. The nearby island of Vieques suffered a similar fate, as the island was right next to Puerto Rico. Communications were down and property destruction was rampant. Whatever was left on the island of Cobera after Hurricane Irma was destroyed after Maria. In Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, damages from Maria sit at $90 billion, with final estimates overall being $91.6 billion in damages caused by Hurricane Maria. Maria stands as the fourth costliest hurricane in the Atlantic Basin. The death toll in Puerto Rico alone stands at 2,975, with 60 missing and presumed dead. Originally, the total was 65. It was vastly underrated. Combining those who were confirmed dead and those who are missing, the total comes in at 3,035. Therefore, 
Hurricane Maria is the deadliest hurricane in U.S. history during the satellite era, and the deadliest hurricane in the Atlantic Basin since Hurricane Mitch. The final death toll for Maria overall stands at 3,059, with 65 missing and presumed dead. Hurricane Maria's impacts to the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles are incomprehensible for the time the storm came. A complete and utter tragedy regarding financial losses and in terms of the human loss of life. Due to the devastation brought to the Caribbean islands, the World Meteorological Organization retired the name Maria in 2018 and would be replaced with Margot for the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season. With a disaster like Maria, the federal government due to Puerto Rico's economic state and lack of resources, would have to pick up the slack and take control of the recovery effort for the three million people on the island who are now left with only their lives. However, that did not happen. The response to Maria's reign of terror to the territories of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands was the worst response from the U.S. federal government to a natural disaster. Back in the Katrina video, I stated that the response to Katrina was the worst response to a natural disaster from all levels of government. While the response to Maria is not the worst considering that the Puerto Rican government did not try to prevent the federal government from helping with recovery, the federal government, specifically Donald Trump and his administration, deliberately took steps to make the recovery effort in Puerto Rico harder than it should have been. I'm not going to say that the Puerto Rican government did nothing wrong. In fact, they were also to blame but the federal government was the primary body that should have been in control. Before I get further into what happened, I want to respond to some claims that defenders of Trump's response make in response to what happened in Puerto Rico. Some people say that the island of Puerto Rico being in debt doesn't mean anything in comparison to the federal government's debt being well into the trillions of dollars. That may seem like a reasonable defense, but it doesn't mean jack when the situations are completely different. When the federal government goes into debt, all Congress has to do is to raise the debt ceiling for the federal government and boom, problem solved, everything goes on as usual. Whether or not that strategy is financially beneficial compared to balancing a budget is not what I'm trying to argue here. What I'm trying to argue is that the state governments, and more specifically, US territories, from what I understand, do not have that luxury. Just for the sake of an example, let's take my home state of Georgia. Every year, the Georgia state budget has to be balanced and passed by the Georgia state legislature and signed by the governor. During this process, it's very important to make sure that the budget does not end up with the state going into debt. Georgia, or states for a matter of fact, cannot raise a debt ceiling because the state constitution nor the state laws do not mention anything like the debt ceiling system at the federal level. What the state of Georgia has to do, and what other states have to do, is that when they go into debt, they have to sell government bonds in order to match the lost revenue that was supposed to be there when the budget was made. Now with Puerto Rico, its debt came from public pension liabilities through decades of corruption, mismanagement, and excessive borrowing. Because there's no way to really deal with the debt other than to pay it off, and because Puerto Rico was a poor territory regarding GDP, and because Puerto Rico was so deeply in debt they could not invest in infrastructure such as its electrical grid, on top of the fact that Puerto Rico does not have access to some governmental programs to the same extent as the states do, because Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, meaning that Puerto Rico has no choice but to rely on the federal government for help, because they seriously cannot do it by themselves because their debt was that bad that it affected basic functions of the government. The comparison between Puerto Rico's debt and the U.S. government's debt is quite ridiculous. But the corrupt government made people hesitant to send aid to Puerto Rico. Counterpoint, if the state and local government is corrupt, which the locals of Puerto Rico know that, by the way, then wouldn't it be best for the federal government to intervene and take over control instead of the state government doing something stupid during the recovery process? Katrina's recovery process was primarily done by the federal government initially, because the state of Louisiana and the city of New Orleans had corrupt officials that wanted to downplay the situation. In Maria, the locals in Puerto Rico were not downplaying the situation. They were begging for help, not blocking it. And if people are seriously going to argue about these two points, let me be clear and say this. The people of Puerto Rico are United States citizens. These are human beings. They should not, under any situation, be punished or left to die because of the actions of corrupt state, local, or federal officials in a natural disaster. Oh, and to the people who say that the government doesn't exist to help people after a disaster. Why does FEMA exist then? Why does FEMA provide financial assistance to people who can prove ownership of their homes? Or better yet, 
Why do governments issue state of emergency for more aid to government operations and for people to be taken care of so people can begin rebuilding? I'm trying to be as impartial and as unbiased as possible, but it's really difficult to do it here. So let's go over what actually happened. The day after Maria's landfall, President Trump stated to reporters that the island of Puerto Rico was completely destroyed. However, it seemed like the two days after Maria's landfall were the only times Trump mentioned Puerto Rico until September 25th, as he was busy doing Trump stuff. He did declare a state of emergency for Puerto Rico and called local officials on the island and pledged to help Puerto Rico. On September 23rd, the main port in San Juan reopened. It was on the 23rd when the true severity of the humanitarian crisis became more and more clear. The island's entire communications infrastructure had been knocked out with 85% of cell towers being inoperable. The Puerto Rican government warns that the Guajataca Dam could fail at any moment. On the 24th, Vice President Mike Pence talked with Jennifer gonzalez Collin, Puerto Rico's non-voting representative in the House. This was the only reported communication between a Puerto Rican leader and the president or vice president during that weekend. On the 25th, the first Trump administration officials visited Puerto Rico to survey the damage including Brock Long from FEMA and Tom Buzzards from the Department of Homeland Security. They returned to Washington that night. The Pentagon issues its first written update stating that 2,600 Department of Defense employees are in the territory or are in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Eight members of the House request that Trump waive the Jones Act for ports in Puerto Rico for one year. The Jones Act is a law that requires ships carrying goods between U.S. ports to fly the American flag, meaning they must abide by U.S. law. It also requires the ships to be built in the United States and owned and operated by American citizens. At 8.45 p.m., Trump tweets that Puerto Rico is in deep trouble and desperately needs aid. This was the first time since the 22nd where Trump publicly talked about Puerto Rico. On the 26th, the Pentagon reports that 44% of Puerto Rico's population is without access to drinking water. Power remains out across most of the island. Trump holds his first coordinating meeting in the Situation Room about Puerto Rico and he talks to Governor Ricardo Rosillo and then to Congresswoman Gonzalez Colon. Governor Rosillo states that there will be a humanitarian crisis and a massive exodus to the United States. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers inspect the Guajataca Dam and find that it's still intact but will need reinforcement. Senators Marco Rubio and Bill Nelson write to Trump asking for additional federal assistance to Puerto Rico. The U.S. Navy announces that USNS Comfort will be leaving for Puerto Rico. The Pentagon announces it's tasking nine additional cargo aircraft with Puerto Rican relief, with seven additional cargo planes for the U.S. Virgin Islands. On the 27th, Trump is asked whether or not he plans to waive the Jones Act, and he says he's thinking about it. On the 28th, 70% of Puerto Rico's hospitals are not functioning. Trump waives the Jones Act for 10 days, and more than 10,000 shipping containers full of food and supplies lay stranded in San Juan, because they cannot be moved into the interior of Puerto Rico due to lack of fuel, labor, and working roads. The Department of Homeland Security Secretary says that she is very satisfied, which totally won't age horribly. The Department of Defense charges Jeffrey Buchanan with looting the U.S. military response in Puerto Rico, who says that 160 million meals will be needed over the next 30 days. The USNS Comfort departed from Norfolk, Virginia, and was expected to arrive in the middle of the next week. On the 29th, FEMA states that of the 69 hospitals in Puerto Rico, one is fully operational, 55 are partially operational, 5 are closed, and the status of 8 are unknown. However, the mayor of San Juan tells reporters that the narrative the White House has stated is different from what the White House has offered. On the 30th, the Pentagon states that 55% of Puerto Ricans do not have access to clean drinking water. The Pentagon also says that about half of grocery and big box stores have reopened across the territory alongside about 851 gas stations. Trump decides to spend the entire day ranting on Twitter about how the mayor of San Juan is a nasty person, and was told by the Democrats to be nasty to him. He writes, and I quote, "...such poor leadership ability by the mayor of San Juan and others in Puerto Rico, who are not able to get their workers to help. They want everything to be done for them when it should be a community effort." On October 1st, more than a thousand people arrive on the island from the Department of Defense, 36% of Puerto Ricans have regained cell service, and the federal government will boost the number of regional supply distribution centers from 11 to 25 or more, according to Governor Rosellio. Trump continues to tweet about how phenomenal the recovery effort is going, as Puerto Rico is still undergoing a humanitarian crisis. 
On the second, the FCC says that about 12% of the cell towers on the island are operational again. On the third, Trump visits Puerto Rico for the first time and tells him that they have really thrown the budget a little out of whack. Implies that Maria isn't really a tragedy like Katrina because of the preliminary death toll being 16 compared to Katrina's death toll of over 1,000, which, again, that statement aged well now, didn't it? And proceeds to throw paper towels and toilet paper into a crowd of onlookers. What the hell was that? From then on, coverage of Maria and, for a matter of fact, comments about it from the Trump administration became less frequent. However, the actual recovery process was still ongoing and extremely slow. Three months later, 45% of Puerto Rico was still without power. Power would not be fully restored to the island as a whole until August of 2018. But the process of restoring the power in Puerto Rico has its own controversy as well. In October 2017, Prepper awarded Whitefish Energy Holdings, a small holding company that portfolios companies who install, maintain, and repair electrical grids, with a $300 million no-bid contract to repair part of the Puerto Rican power grid. However, the status of the contract and what it contained was very suspicious. For starters, the contract stated that FEMA approved its terms, but FEMA said that they had no involvement in the contract itself, and later expressed significant concern over how PREPA procured the contract, and the agency had not confirmed whether or not the contract prices were reasonable because the contract was given without the competitive bidding process. Not to mention that PREPA chose Whitefish Energy Holdings over mutual aid agreements because... reasons. There was also a clause in the contract that prevented the government from auditing or reviewing the labor cost and profit. After the contract was awarded, Whitefish sent a few hundred workers, mostly subcontractors, which is another red flag, since hiring workers through mutual aid agreements could possibly be a cheaper alternative. The workers who were hired by Whitefish were ten times more expensive than PREPA's own workers, in the contract, Whitefish Energy was allowed to charge PREPA $319 an hour for linemen, which is just pure insanity. On October 29th, Governor Roselio requested PREPA to cancel the contract, and within a few hours, PREPA cancelled the contract. The day after the contract was cancelled, the FBI announced that they were investigating the contract between PREPA and Whitefish Energy. Now, I don't want to say what ended up happening was that the Puerto Rican government got scammed by Whitefish, but considering that they spent $300 million at a company that had two total workers and did all their work via subcontractors that were paid multiple times the average salary of electrical workers in Puerto Rico, just from the price alone, it's definitely close to being a scam. The economy was in shambles for years after Maria hit. Repairs to homes were not completed, and schools were closed. Regarding the local government, in 2019, messages between Governor Roselio and his staff were leaked including a bunch of terrible stuff not relevant to this video, but also messages mocking the troubles of Puerto Ricans after Maria destroyed the island. One such message from Moselio's chief financial officer joked about the people who died during Maria, and there was also an apparent death threat made by Moselio against the mayor of San Juan. After days of protest, Governor Moselio announced that he would be resigning as governor. In January 2020, abandoned warehouses full of supplies that were sent to help with the aftermath of Hurricane Maria were discovered near ponds. Locals are outraged at the local government for not distributing the supplies, and the emergency management director was fired by Governor Wanda Vasquez. Governor Vasquez was subsequently put under investigation for violations to the state law and federal regulations regarding the handling of the aid to the victims of the earthquake swarm. She claimed that the investigation was politically motivated, but was unable to prove her claims. She was later arrested in 2022 on the basis of corruption related to bribery during her 2020 gubernatorial campaign. To this day, many areas are now covered with blue tarp and are in desperate need of repairs. The response and aid to Puerto Rico was awful, due to disorganization, unpreparedness, and horrific private comments on the local level. But the majority of the blame is aimed at the federal government, and that criticism is 100% valid. Primarily because the actual response and actual actions taken on the ground to work as fast as possible to help those on the ground were unusually slow. One reason was because, of course, Puerto Rico was not located close to the mainland US. This was a contributing factor, but it does not mean that the federal government is immune from being criticized here. Starting off with the first issue, the Department of Homeland Security did not immediately waive the Jones Act for Puerto Rico which prevented Puerto Rico from receiving any aid and supplies from foreign flag vessels from U.S. ports. It was ultimately waived for 10 days starting on September 28th after Puerto Rico Governor Roselio formally requested it. 
Oh yeah, and Trump didn't really mention Maria in Puerto Rico again until September 25th through Twitter. Of course, he said that food, water, and medical supplies were a top priority. The vast majority of Puerto Rico still without power and communication services. Speaking of Trump, it seemed like he wanted to help Puerto Rico as little as possible. Behind closed doors, Trump instructed officials to closely monitor Puerto Rico's disaster relief because he believed the island's government was corrupt. Which, to be fair, he wasn't wrong about Puerto Rico's government being corrupt, but again, timing. He also supposedly told staff that he didn't want to have a single dollar of relief funding go to Puerto Rico and even suggesting trading Puerto Rico for Greenland. Of course, those statements are not confirmed through audio, but it wouldn't be out of character. I'm trying as hard as possible to be as unbiased as I can here. Federal aid was subsequently delayed as in 2019 and 2020, the Trump administration added layers of federal review to approve and hand out federal aid to U.S. territories. This resulted in a total of $20 billion in recovery money being delayed to Puerto Rico. Investigations into this delayed aid were pretty much stopped during the Trump administration and was only discovered when President Biden took office. Even with the vast majority of supplies that the federal government did send out, the problem became that there were very few ways to transport those supplies. Due to a lack of fuel, labor, and working roads, the supplies and food could not be delivered into the inner areas of the island. The issue of labor and trucks could easily be solved if the federal government stepped in and somehow got contractors to assist with that, but it seems like that wasn't done. Supplies were abandoned and left about. The issue of the supplies being abandoned is at the fault of both the federal government, but primarily at the local government. The issue of infrastructure also lies at the local level since FEMA does not rebuild houses. However, the money needed to fund things like rebuilding homes and the power grid was all over the place. As of November 2021, over $50 billion was given to Puerto Rico to help assist with the aftermath of Maria. Of course, the majority of that went unspent due to the lack of familiarity with disaster programs, issues with labor and supplies, inflation, reaching agreements on the projects, and yes, a portion due to corruption. FEMA funds specifically were an issue, as only 18% of FEMA's funds allocated for the island were actually delivered as of 2021. Because the majority of the money went unspent, projects that were supposed to help better prepare the island for natural disasters by updating the infrastructure haven't begun or even been completed. Not to mention that any sort of progress made to rebuilding Puerto Rico has been delayed by additional natural disasters such as an earthquake swarm from December 2019 into January 2020, and more recently, Hurricane Fiona of 2022. There is so much more to talk about regarding this topic, and I seriously cannot do it justice. Normally, there would be a simplified way to talk about all that went wrong, but everything that went wrong was done in such a spectacularly complex fashion that would mean that this video ends up being extremely long. But I want to give a general statement on what went down regarding the recovery effort. While the failed response to Hurricane Maria lies partially on the local governments because they were in charge of actually planning what to do after a storm comes by, and because they are also in charge of distributing the vast majority of supplies in the area, I cannot, in good faith, place the majority of the blame on Puerto Rico's government. There was corruption at the local level. There were problems that I cannot for the life of me find. They were not saints in the situation. However, in a case where we are talking about a United States territory, specifically one where the vast majority of the residents are in severe poverty and lack some constitutional rights, and the government is billions and billions of dollars in debt and cannot invest into its infrastructure and cannot truly help recover by themselves, they had to rely on the federal government. By declaring a state of emergency and begging for federal help, the territory of Puerto Rico was stating that they ran out or are running low on adequate resources to help the territory recover. According to the National Response Plan, when a state or territory exhausts their resources, both in terms of essential goods and services, and requests federal aid, it is the federal government's job to respond as swiftly as possible. But the response the federal government provided to Puerto Rico was utterly abysmal, specifically from Trump himself. He seemingly did not talk about Maria a lot after it occurred until the 25th, the vast majority of talking from him, about Maria, after the disaster, was aimed about how he was being criticized and how in reality the response was the best thing ever, more focused on arguing like a small child on Twitter with public officials because the aid wasn't coming in fast enough. He was arguing and whining instead of publicly trying to find a way to get aid to Puerto Rico faster. 
The unnecessary roadblocks that were put in place during 2019 and 2020 were put in place by the Trump administration. All Trump could do was compare how Maria was nothing compared to Katrina, when Maria ended up being vastly worse than Katrina when it came to the human death toll. In his defense, this would have been a disastrous event for anyone who was in the Oval Office at the time. No matter who it would have been, the situation regarding Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands after Maria would have been a complete and utter disaster. But the constant bickering with public officials and saying the response was phenomenal, even after being told about the death toll being over 3,000, just makes me sick to my stomach. I'm putting a lot of effort into trying to be impartial here, but that's easier said than done. If people are mad that I'm covering this, then keep in mind that the failed response to the storm is partially why the death toll is so high. Not all the blame lies with the Trump administration, but a majority of it does. The constant bickering and infighting and offhand comments is what made the response to Hurricane Maria worse than the response to Katrina if we are talking about the federal government. Both administrations were not completely aware of what they were doing, but at least the Bush administration was in downright malicious towards the local governments while people were still suffering. Sorry if I got too political there or too opinionated. I knew I was going to have to address the elephant in the room one way or the other regarding Maria's recovery. I've spent long enough talking about the failed recovery. Time to wrap this up. Hurricane Maria is a storm that lives in infamy to those in the Lesser and Greater Antilles, specifically for the U.S. Virgin Islands, Dominica, and Puerto Rico. The island of Dominica was turned into an island of scattered debris. The U.S. Virgin Islands, already battered by Hurricane Irma, were hit once more. And the island of Puerto Rico was changed forever. Dominica was swept clean. Barely anything was left on the small nation after Maria tore through the nation. Hurricane Maria was the worst disaster to strike the island in recent memory. Maria was also the most intense tropical cyclone worldwide that year, with a minimum central pressure of 908 millibars and peak winds of 175 miles per hour. The devastation left could not be explained by words alone, especially for the island of Puerto Rico. The island of Puerto Rico was changed forever. The damage still lasts to this day. The damage to the people still lasts to this day. The damage to the history and lives of everyone in Puerto Rico lasts to this day, five years after Maria struck. The failed response from the local governments, but more specifically the federal government and the Trump administration, led for Puerto Rico to seemingly be left out. With the people left with nothing but hearing the ramblings of Trump about how the response was amazing, when people were dying of dehydration and illnesses related to the poor state of Puerto Rico after Maria had passed. And the same sentiment also lies in the Virgin Islands. Many areas have not been completely rebuilt, but compared to five years ago, the island has come a long way. There is still a lot more to do in Puerto Rico. From the Trump administration further delaying aid to other events such as earthquakes and Hurricane Fiona, Puerto Rico's recovery has been delayed time and time again. However, it wasn't all awful. Many outside organizations came in to help Puerto Rico recover when the federal government ignored them, more specifically Oxfam and Refugees International, which stated as the majority of federal aid stopped two months after Maria, the island still needed a lot of aid from the government. People across the United States and abroad came in to help volunteer and help rebuild Puerto Rico. Those people are often touted as heroes to those who live in Puerto Rico. And those people truly are heroes. I know that I've likely angered some regarding my statements on the Trump administration, but it had to be said. It's not an attempt to make everything political. It's an attempt to realize that failing to respond to these disasters costs lives. If only it was as simple as to blame Puerto Rico as being lazy and corrupt, when in reality, the background as to why Puerto Rico needed so much help is complicated and complex, but it allows people to understand why Puerto Rico needed the outside aid desperately. Over five years later, Hurricane Maria is not forgotten by those in the states, and those in Puerto Rico, those in the Lesser Antilles, amongst so many others, and it should never be forgotten due to its impacts to those who lost everything, including family members, friends, and neighbors. It's a storm that I will not forget anytime soon. Sorry about this not coming out sooner, I had a severe case of dealing with the beginnings of moving out of my grandparents' house. 
1993 Storm of the Century video will be the last video recorded in the house that I'm at right now. So, funny story about that little comment. Uh, turns out, uh, we have no idea, because apparently there's more stuff that keeps coming up about the security of the house, about me not being here, that is continuing to be talked about, and I have no idea exactly what's going to happen, so by the time this comes out, I don't even know if I'm moving out at this point. I don't even know what's happening at this point. Please, I just want this all to end! Of course, I would still be on schedule, and with spring break coming up in two weeks at the time of writing this, I should be able to get three videos out in March. Exciting, I know. This was very emotionally and mentally challenging to write, as I knew I couldn't be as opinionated on this topic as I tend to be. I tried to keep it semi-professional, but I know that I let loose a couple times, but I know it has to be that way. Anyways, more credit stuff. Special thanks to my proofreaders, those being Broker, Alice, and Rishi, and Celtic White for the character service that I use, and everyone for watching, it means a lot. Special thanks to those who are subscribed to the channel Patreon, or are a YouTube member. Those being Ace Cooper, Maxwell Looney, Montpellier, Tedeo's Weather Space Station, Tanner Lipper, and that dude at the Alfie's Army tier, and Basilius of Stupidonia, Hannah Stormer, Jay Cario, King Shisha, Non Binary, Origin, Sandra Dunn West, Talkboy, and Worm Off the String at the Alf Midi tier. If you want to have access to my full uncut interviews and my scripts alongside other things in the future, consider subscribing to the Patreon or becoming a member. It helps me financially and will allow me to do in person interviews in the future. But I saved three specific shoutouts for last. For those who have been keen listeners to the music that I've been using throughout my videos, they mainly consist of video game OSTs. Well, I'm going to begin relying on them less and less, at least the ones from AAA Studios. Doesn't mean that the music that I've been using before is going to be completely cut from here on out, in fact I used Significance Nothing at the very beginning of this video, it just means that it's going to be appearing less and less. My three shoutouts are specifically to those who have created Ace Attorney fan music who have given me permission to use their fan-made Ace Attorney style music tracks in my videos. Those being Zinni for his music for his cancelled Ace Attorney fan game, Cyanide Blue for their music labeled for Natsuki Ace Attorney, and last but not least, Krakalek for their music from their fan game, Gyakuten Live. I apologize if I mispronounced any of those. Give them all a follow for more awesome music, and in the case of Krakalek, for their fan game where the music is used for, Gyakuten Live. Gyakuten Live is an actual Ace Attorney fan game based on the Love Live School Idol Project universe. It's still in the works, and there are only two cases out for it right now, but I highly recommend playing it if you are into Ace Attorney, and especially if you are a Love Life fan. I cannot wait to see where the story continues. If you want to play it, there's a link in the description to the website where you can download the game. Also, special thanks to Xavier Burns, also known as FCX Animations, for the track animation of Hurricane Maria that I used throughout the video. That being said, I'm Alfaria. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what I do, consider liking, subscribing, commenting your thoughts, sharing it around, all that jazz. You all stay safe out there, and I'll see you all soon for the 1993 Storm of the Century Retrospective.